uh, shall we start with the introductions? So, Jakub, please. Yeah, so hi, I'm uh, Jakub. I uh, am the founder of Zeta Alpha. I've been in uh, AI field for a long time. And um, our goal is to build platforms that keep you informed and also to inform you in webinars like this uh, in person uh, to make sure that you pay attention to the things in AI and data science that matter. Thanks. And uh, my name is Sergio Castella. I'm the AI community manager at Zeta Alpha, and I try to stay up to date with what's going on in the world of AI. Uh, every month we do this recap, sort of uh, analyzing the trends. I write a blog piece that you can check on our blog on our website, zeta-alpha.com. Um, yeah, you can find it there. Uh, and we're going to talk about that um, shortly. We're also going to talk about uh, some news. Right, that's that have been uh, developing um, this past month. But first, I think Jakub wanted to say um, a few words about some other relevant matters. Yeah, I'm well, it's been really hard to uh, pay attention to the news because uh, um, end of February we've been surprised with this um, pretty horrible news and um, the war in Ukraine. So our thoughts are uh, clearly a lot with um, the civilians uh, that are suffering through that war um, and we're hoping to do also some stuff that um, um, helps them in donating and uh, things like that um, this is uh, a picture of the um, um, of the nuclear plant that was in the news um, this evening or yesterday evening so um, yeah, we thought it would be a bit frivolous to talk about startups and funding and and uh, um, things like that. So um, yeah, that's a bit of a shadow over our uh, uh, usually uh, bright and, and cheerful um, uh, webinar approach, but um, uh, we'll try to keep you informed as well. And I think um, the uh, uh, aspect of uh, nuclear energy is uh, is actually uh, the first news that uh, that we um, uh, we uh, noticed last month in AI. Um, uh, in fact, uh, DeepMind has uh, not only uh, revolutionized kind of the way uh, medicine could work, but they're attacking another field of science, which is uh, nuclear fusion. Did you see this one, Sergi? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was actually quite uh, surprised because um, I wasn't really expecting uh, DeepMind to be working in this kind of uh, line of, of research. Um, but I don't know, I, every time I, I see nuclear fusion on a headline, uh, my kind of skeptic hat, uh, I, I wear my skeptic hat and I'm a little bit, uh, you know, uh, wary of that. Um, so I don't know, what, 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 what do you think uh, about this um, piece of news? Well, nuclear fusion has been kind of a, uh, a, a, a holy grail for a long time. And for sure, it's a lot safer than those nuclear reactors uh, that, uh, that are in the battlefield uh, today um, uh, because it doesn't uh, require uranium and, and doesn't produce mm -hmm. nuclear waste. And what uh, DeepMind has done here is basically framed uh the uh, so the the idea of uh, of a nuclear fusion reactor is that you have to keep this uh this plasma this this super hot plasma in a very uh high magnetic field using this set of magnetic coils and that's actually kind of a, a control problem a nonlinear control problem and so they they basically applied their sort of regular uh, staple uh, deep reinforcement learning to this problem. And they've learned uh, a, a set of policies that allow pretty efficient control of this uh, very hot uh, mm -hmm. nuclear plasma. Uh, yeah, my under yeah, my understanding is that it's, uh, it's gonna, it should uh, ideally help scientists working on the problem to make um, advancements, not necessarily be the, the the solution itself yeah so i think they actually did try it for a little bit in a swiss um a swiss uh plasma reactor um and um uh, they uh compiled the the trained deep learning model actually to work in in like in real time in that reactor 
So uh, it's some pretty nifty engineering there as well. Um, and the but the model was not trained on actual data from the reactor. It is it was trained from uh, on um, uh, on a simulator. So that's a little bit of uh, domain shift there, probably when you go into the real world. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but definitely an interesting uh, thing to keep an eye on. Well, uh, I think uh, Europe's going to have to uh, become more energy independent uh, very soon. So uh, uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, I personally believe more in uh, uh, classic uh, renewable energy, photovoltaic and, um, and um, windmills. Well, well, Dutch, right? We believe in windmills. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you think DeepMind is kind of the first one working on this, it's not the case. Uh, there's a couple of uh, uh, overview references in the in the Nature paper that they published. Uh, advancing fusion with machine learning research is a is a good overview. Um, and there's also a paper if you are on the Z Alpha platform. Applications of deep learning in nuclear fusion research from a while ago. And uh, if you um, uh, look at the related work in Zeta Alpha from that, you get this nice overview of, uh, of the field. So if you planning to move from um, face recognition into nuclear fusion, this is a good start. Yeah, and um, I, I I also wanted to highlight some quick um, light uh, news. Uh, first of all, Archive is actually support or officially supporting uh, um, <clears throat> uh, viewing papers as web pages. Uh, this is a collaboration um, with uh, this lab that uh, has built a converter from LaTeX uh, that renders LaTeX uh, into HTML. So you can now uh, change the X in the Archive URL for a file, um, and that should render the paper in HTML. I think this is really interesting, but also I wanted to hear uh, Jakub's uh, quick thoughts on on whether this will challenge the you know the dominance of the PDF as as a medium um, of scientific publication, or or if that's never going to change. Uh, well, I've, I I'm trying to read PDFs on my phone, <laughs> but it's not usually working really well. So I think uh, there's something yeah. to be be said there. But I, I think for most researchers. Uh, controlling the formatting of the tables is a is a holy is like a, a red <laughs> line, right? Once your phone starts formatting the the the, yeah, the, the, yeah, the really yeah. complicated multicellular tables in your paper, uh, you mm -hmm. would not be happy. So that might be the the reason why my PDF is so strong. Well, is this um, uh, is this development based on this archive vanity uh, project that you know? Uh, I think that they're running a similar backend. Yes. Uh, right. If not the same, there's an open source project um, that uh, that is a converter from LaTeX to HTML, um, and they're uh, basing it on that. So um, yeah, we also have some pretty nice uh, features in the roadmap. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. uh, not only reading uh, archive articles in uh, Zeta Alpha, but also annotating them. So stay tuned; it's uh, it's almost uh, ready for release. Um, so then other things that I wanted to quickly highlight, there's this uh, sort of talk by Jan Lekun on, uh, on his vision for the, you know, the future of AI systems. And I wanted to link that back to, I feel like in the last couple of years, also Geoffrey Hinton and um, Joshua Vengio kind of have painted this sort of broad, uh, broad roadmap that they, um, that they think how, uh, you know, the AI field uh, should move. And I think that's kind of um, interesting to to um, to read about that, um, I think it's interesting that they're all kind of very focused on on thinking about how the brain does things and try to you know learn from from that. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, I I'm I'm really curious to see if if that's a direction that the AI community as a whole kind of takes more on uh, to try to you know bridge that gap with the neuroscience. Um, and then we have TorchRec, which is this library for uh, recommendation uh, systems uh, based on PyTorch. And also this news from New Zero uh, used in video compression uh, in tandem with uh, YouTube, I believe. Um, and there's this open source codec that um, I think you cannot use yet, but um, um, 
yeah, that, that they have been working on and they use pretty much reinforcement learning to learn uh, more efficient and better uh, lossy compression for, for video. There was another uh, set of news on uh, Meta actually um, um, generating the metaverse using speech. Did you did you see that one? Um, is it the the direct uh, translation of speech? Yeah, it's um, like translation of, from speech to uh, to uh, 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 pastures, tropical islands, and uh, fantasy conference rooms. <laughs> no, I think I think I haven't. I, I didn't see that. I only saw the um, the one about translation, um, uh, translation spe translating speech uh, end to end without uh, without text um, to text. Uh, yeah, no, this is a different one. It was demoed by Mark Zuckerberg uh, on some event. All right. So, so think, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Just for those who uh, who don't know Zeta Alpha, um, we are. Uh, um, building this platform to keep you informed through events like uh, like uh, today's webinar, uh, but also through our um, uh, our uh, uh, discovery and organization platform. Uh, won't say a lot about that, but if you want to try it out, go to our website. Uh, we think it's the smartest way to discover and organize knowledge in AI for AI and data science teams. And basically, uh, we use neural search, um, so dense neural retrieval, to make it really easy to discover new papers and existing related work, uh, find similar, uh, visualize um, what's going on, and discover trends. Because we also couple uh, what's trending on social media and Twitter, uh, especially, and uh, what's going on on GitHub to papers. Um, and allow you not only to um, organize your own reading collections, but also to um, to use these signals to uh, discover what's trending and to stay up to date. Uh, so, in some sense, that makes Sergi's job really easy. I think, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I use uh, this pattern pr precisely to curate um, the list of topics that uh, that I highlight on the monthly blog. Uh, and to keep track of the, you know, the papers that I, I find uh, interesting, keep my notes on that, get some recommendations, and that makes the whole cycle um, much more streamlined. Yeah, so here we see actually all of the papers uh, that were published in uh, in March. The total is, is not exactly all of them, but the most uh, influential and most discussed ones, uh, I think about a thousand of them uh, would be really hard to go through the whole list on archive. Uh, but using this kind of clustering, it's pretty uh, fast to get an overview. And what we basically do is pick up uh, uh, some of the ones that uh, have the most traction, especially in discussions on, on Twitter. And that's uh, where the selection comes uh, from. And this one I picked up just a few days ago. I believe yeah, it's from 1st of March, right? So just two days ago. Yeah, just uh, two days ago. So uh, um, uh, I don't know. I haven't uh, fully digested it yet, but it seems like a big breakthrough. So uh, uh, what you see here in this graph is um, uh, various very large uh, transformer models over the years. Uh, and on the y-axis, you see the number of layers. So we're all talking deep learning. Uh, and in transformers, that usually means like between 12 and, uh, and 50 uh, layers, roughly, which is a lot. Uh, and the, the reason nobody has made these models a lot deeper is because um, when, you, um, when you do that, you get a lot of instability during training. It's very hard to converge. And um, um, yeah, so what they've done these guys uh, from from Microsoft Research Asia uh, and their code is online um, is they've actually managed to train uh, a very large uh, transformer model with a thousand uh, layers um, and um, well that's uh, a feat by itself but what they show is that there's actually a very interesting scaling behavior 
that if you um, keep the number of parameters constant and you increase the depth of the network, uh, they test this on a very challenging uh, machine learning, uh, sorry, machine translation uh, data set, um, multilingual, um, uh, uh, massively multilingual machine translation, and they see a lot of improvement by ju just increasing the depth of the network. So that's a very interesting scaling uh, factor. Um, and all of that they do uh, by just changing a few lines of code in the initialization of the network and in the um, uh, normalization layers. So basically what they do is they, um, they add uh, a, a sim single uh, parameter that controls the, um, uh, uh, the contribution to the normalization of the um, of the uh, regular layers and the um, how do you say the the um, um, the residual uh, connections, right? In 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 the transformer, you have these residual connections which connect the input to all the way to the output, and they scale that up or down in in various ways, and this uh, removes this training instability. So it seems like a very interesting trick. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. And and, and I think that, I mean, the, one of the most interesting insights is this uh, scaling law of keeping, maintaining parameters and uh, increasing the, um, whether that's like a more efficient use of, of the parameters um, of a model. Yeah. So um, we'll see whether this gets adopted. Maybe uh, it's too simple to be true, but uh, it sounds promising. Absolutely. So um, the second paper that I wanted to talk about is this uh, data max data multiplexing. Uh, this is a very simple idea. I would say that the results are also not a very simple idea. All good ideas are simple, right? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, uh, so this is multiplexing is something that is used in signal processing. It's, it's a very simple idea, which is um, in order to make, uh, you know, to utilize um, a channel to its maximum potential, you combine a lot of signals together to communicate them through this channel, and then you kind of uh, untangle them um, at the end of the of the of the channel. Um, so what they do here is they basically get a, a batch uh, of inputs into a neural network, a really large batch. For instance, here they have a six uh, six hundred and forty instances. And they downsize this by chunking these into like merging them into um, by a, a fixed transformation, a linear transformation and pooling transformation. And then only running through the neural network, the sort of compressed um, version of, of that batch input. And then at the end of the, um, they multiplex it and then do the prediction on that. And um, uh, the advantage of this is that you can get much higher uh, efficiencies right? when, when you run uh, through the network. And what they claim is that the, um, that the decrease in performance is not, not all that great. And I believe that's um, very interesting because I can see how that can be useful in a lot of applications where you're doing uh, batched inference and speed is critical and you have a very large model. Um, and with this me mechanism, you can achieve speed ups of, uh, you know, like uh, more than one order of, of magnitude pretty easily. Now, the, the downside of that is, like I said, the decrease in performance is not all that, up, like, is, is not that uh, small. So there is a noticeable decrease. Um, and secondly, the, in this paper, they show how you can do this training the network end to end. Um, and in my opinion, it would be really interesting to see what happens if you can get a frozen model that you can ha have access as, you know, like as a kind of black box, box API. And you can sort of train this, this input output uh, mechanism to sort of compress your input and run it really quickly through the network and get uh, predictions. But um, I think this might be a, an idea that is kind of uh, has very high practical interest on the application side of, of things. Oh, so, so is this during inference or during <laughs> training that they do this? Here, they, they both train and do inference <clears throat> with this mechanism. Um, but I think that the, where the mechanism shines is, is inference. Right. Uh, because it, so you can basically much, do like batch inference on, on much larger batches. Uh, correct. Correct. Right. Yeah. So, so imagine you only have access to a, you know, a, a GPT-3 API and you can do batch inference on that, but, you know, you have a limit on batch size, um, you know, 32 or something. Um, 
if you if you can cram into that like a, a batch that's ten times the size of that, uh, with this mechanism you can speed up your your application um, by a lot. Yeah, but uh, if I understand it correctly, you do actually need access to the like uh, to the numerical input to the network, right? You cannot. Yeah. You cannot do this when, when your API um, uh, uh, accepts batches of text, for example, or images. Correct, correct. You need uh, a numerical input, uh, access to this. And uh, like I said, in this paper, they retrain the whole system end to end. Mm. But um, I think that there is some potential to, to see how you can adapt this to, to other uh, situations. So uh, definitely something to, 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 to keep an eye on for, for the work. So the next paper, transfer memory as a differentiable search index. I would say personally, this is my favorite uh, from the month. Um, and so, so much so that we're gonna actually have a, a special episode on, on, on this, um, on our upcoming uh, podcast on neural uh, information retrieval. But before that, uh, Jakob, can you uh, give us um, you know, like a quick overview of this? Yeah, this, is, this really falls in the category of crazy ideas in my book, yeah. but... Uh, it's maybe maybe uh, in the category of crazy ideas worth trying. So uh, this paper actually goes. We we discussed this idea before in 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 June last year. There was this paper from Donald Metzler and other colleagues at at uh, Google, um, uh, rethinking search, making domain experts out of dilettantes, and he proposed this idea in this paper, but without implementing it. And it's like. Okay, that's a crazy <laughs> idea, but it's pretty obvious it wouldn't work, right? Yeah. Because what they do is they basically train a neural network uh, for information retrieval without having any sort of retrieval component. Uh, they just train the network to, um, oh, there was a proposal to have as input the text of the, uh, of the documents and as output the document IDs to do kind of, uh, yeah, just... Uh, predict the ID of the document. And that supposedly would work for retrieval. Well, we thought, okay, well, we'll wait until you show us. And they showed us because in this paper uh, with a, a somewhat expanded author list, uh, among them also uh, our Amsterdam he uh, transformer hero, Mostafa Degani uh, and William Cohen also not to be, um, uh, forgotten because he actually did a lot of interesting work on um, uh, differentiable question answering systems. So I can see why he uh, um, why he has a, a sympathy for this idea. So what do they do? Uh, they basically uh, present textual inputs, documents, and um, as outputs, they uh, they they um, have a category like a unique, like a uh, extreme multi-class classification. You could say a category that is the document ID, and th they they learn this. Um, so you basically have every document with its document ID in the training corpus, but on top of that, they also mix in questions and the and and the and the document ID uh that answers that question and you would say this is a very weird idea because normally in retrieval you train these document representations and then you encode the query and then you retrieve the nearest vector from uh, a storage system and and that's your uh, uh answer uh, but here all uh the knowledge about the documents is stored in the transformer i think that's crazy yeah, and I mean, to me, this, the, the thing that's hardest to like to wrap my head around is this idea that, yeah, there, there, there's really nothing semantically relevant, right, about the document ID. So if if you're gonna have any new document on your index, um, how could you how how would you deal with that? Is it is it um, is this mechanism something that could only work um, in a in a setting where where you where you have a static index that can never change, for instance? Yeah, I think that I think that's what they what they do now. I mean, it's really on a fixed document collection that that they made this idea uh, work. But I I thought it wouldn't even work on on that, right? Yeah, it's somewhat related to this uh, paper. I think you discussed it earlier uh, on uh, autoregressive named entity linking, 
right? Correct. It was something similar like that. Yeah, they, they, they mentioned that they had this um, uh, this paper as a as a sort of inspiration as well. But in that case, the IDs that they generate are like canonical names of entities, which are exactly which have some sort of meaning, right? Yeah, exactly. They are uh, semantically. Uh, and here is just a random, uh, random uh, integer, basically. They, they do. They do try different. Uh, we shouldn't get into the um, uh, that in depth, but they do try different ways of tokenizing the this document ID, right? Um, I right. Think that, yeah, here they have yeah. like the, this atomic ID, na a naive string, and and semantic string dot ID. Yeah, so the atomic the atomic ID doesn't work that well. So that's kind of mm -hmm. the, the most extreme uh, version of this idea. But, uh, still. but still, on, so they, they tested it on this natural questions data set and still the atomic ID beats BM25, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's pretty good. And yeah. uh, it also uh, happens to beat in most cases on this collection, uh, the T5 dual encoder, right? That separately encodes the query in the document and then does uh, nearest neighbor retrieval, uh, retrieval. So that's pretty amazing. Uh, I have some doubts that whether they like fully optimize the dual encoder because I'm not sure these are like state of the art results on this data set. They also report this bit uh, unusual metric hits at one and hits at 10. Usually it's more like NDCG, MRR, these kind of things. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, one, one other thing that I find uh, particularly interesting is how the scale of the model here is um, extremely important, right? In the um, in the performance, because indeed now it's like the whole corpus needs to be in some way memorized in the in the parameters of the of the model. So um, Intuitively, it makes a lot of sense that uh, you really need a lot of parameters to do that effectively. Definitely not the most efficient uh, way to uh, start your index. I guess. No, but I, I'm 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 that. really curious to see how these um, research translate to all, a lot of other data sets and and larger indexes and and uh, all all of these uh, questions because you know this is only still one data set. And. Uh, uh, I just want to men uh, mention uh, something uh, with respect to your remark on these different encodings. So the, the naive string doc ID, they like try to predict the numbers, the integers the, as a string kind of, uh, that already works a little bit better. Uh, and this one is really a bit uh, where the future of this probably needs to go. Uh, semantic string doc ID, they basically like structure the documents into clusters and then the doc ID is kind of like a like a um, like a path from the root from the root mm -hmm. of the tree to the to the cluster. So it's, a, it's like a like essentially a like a semantic yeah. label in some, uh, yeah. like a category label in some sense. And that obviously works the best uh, for for most of those cases. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we'll dive deeper into into this um, in the future, but um, super. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Don and both Mustafa both offered to give some feedback on our on our podcast. So uh, yeah. maybe we can ask them some uh, some tough questions. So I think this is not a real sort of uh, path to production for anything. It's more like a um, a mind uh, experiment. Uh, well, it's still, it might design. be in some uh, niche applications, right? Where the um, yeah, like a really, really large computer where you can run an 11 billion <laughs> parameter T5 model, but where you <laughs> only have a really small corpus to index. <laughs> I don't know. Something like that. Let's see. Anyway, um, I think that we can jump into the next paper that uh, had quite a bit of a buzz, which is this uh, gradients without backdrop. This was super popular on Twitter and it generated a lot of discussions. Um, yeah. I can see it, why it's very interesting. Uh, the gist of it is is um, basically that in a neural network you can calculate gradients without the traditional reverse mode backdrop by doing these finite differences um, thing. This is a, a known a numerical method for estimating uh, the gradient, and the idea is this simple thing that if you evaluate a function at one point and you evaluate it a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left, and then you sort of divide by how wide that is, you're gonna get a sense of how steep um, that function is there. And if you do this in the in the multi-dimensional case, 
you can sample like perturbation vectors in various directions and see how steep the function is in that in that space to an average and get a, a gradient. Um, and basically they apply these into neural networks and they show that it can work if you tune it very well. Um, there was a lot of discussion that I found interesting about like to what degree this was uh, relevant, useful. Um, so a couple of things uh, come to mind. First, the, I, um, um, they make a point about the memory usage um, of this mechanism that could have some uh, interesting um, properties um, because you can calculate it during the forward pass instead of having like a different forward. It's like it's like half your memory consumption, basically, right? Yes, but um, I think that maybe the most interest interesting, at least to me, maybe not useful, but interesting is this idea of. Um, how this could be connected to this whole uh, biological plausibility thing of how um, the how the brain, how neurons in the brain learn, right? Because it, it's a very common criticism of back propagation that you know the brain cannot learn that way because neurons don't have reverse mode communication. So um, I, I don't know. It, I guess it's an interesting uh, uh, research question for the folks working in the neuroscience and in the, at the intersection of, of these fields. Uh, I, have, I have two thoughts. First of first one is more like mathematical, like, okay, I can see this numerical method working in like a low dimensional space, but does it actually work well if you're like in a super high dimensional space? Don't you suffer extreme well, from a, like curse of dimensionality yeah. when you're in a thousand you dimensional a lot, space? You have, they have a lot of problems with having very high uh, variance in their estimates. So right. their estimation of the gradient is probably non-biased, but at the same time, it has a very high variance. So you have to get um, a lot of samples to get a good, uh, a good um, gradient. And also you have to get very, very small learning rates. So I think that in, in practical settings, this is not gonna replace backdrop anytime soon. Um, yeah, I also I also read somewhere that they like um, they they can only do it if the learning rate is very uh, like it's not it doesn't work to have a high learning rate Be because basically yeah. if you have a very high variance in this uh, estimate and you jump in the wrong direction you're immediately off the track so they can only mm -hmm. do it with the, this learning is essentially very slow because the learning rate needs to be very very small. So I see a, a comment from Youssef um, highlighting that this is uh, intended for reinforcement learning. Um, and um, that is a good, uh, a good point. I am actually um, unsure how, how this could be more useful in that, uh, in that um, domain, but um, definitely interesting too. And um... sorry. Um, yeah, the, the other quick thing that I wanted to mention is it's kind of interesting that the, um, there's this iClear paper 2022, which proposes a very similar um, approach. Yeah, I think his point is, uh, uh, Yusef points is that that one is for reinforcement. Ah, ah okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I missed that. So yeah. maybe that's... Okay. Uh, the, I understand. Yeah, yes. Just coming back to this kind of biological plausibility thing. So obviously, if you have kind of happy and learning, right? It, it only works in uh, uh, in uh, uh, with one layer perceptrons to to find uh, uh, gradient to do gradient descent. Uh, so maybe this is an idea. But I'm just trying to wrap my head around like if you have like neurons and synapses, right? And you have this forward communication. What is the equivalent of finding the gradient in in like a numerical way? Is it maybe could it be like the noisiness of those like that the noisiness of the communication actually has the role of finding this gradient? I have I have no idea what is the best way to think about that. Honestly, <laughs> I wish I, I wish I did though. It's um, probably a very salient question to answer. All right. Well, I'm sure more discussion at iClear yeah. on this will be uh, will be done. We we'll see if we can find other people also who can answer these questions. So not practically useful yet, but super interesting. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, all right, on to the next oh. um, uh, paper. Yeah, the hierarchical perceiver. This is a kind of an iteration on a paper we already talked about, right? 
Yeah, so the perceiver uh, that was, uh, I think, early last year or July yeah, or something months. like that. Uh, so uh, the perceiver is a general purpose um, uh, architecture uh, that I think has the sort of ambition to replace the transformer. It's very similar to transformers in the basic building blocks. Uh, but basically, if you want to encode very large inputs into a transformer, it doesn't scale well because it has this quadratic attention uh, mechanism. Uh, and there have been, uh, I think, a whole cottage industry rising up on making the transformer uh, uh, behave better than, than quadratic. Um, and this is like the, the, the long farmer, the big bird, the, uh, well, name them all. I think there's about 100 papers on that. Uh, the perceiver takes a completely different approach uh, in that they basically uh, don't try to have the input uh, in the transformer, but they place the input in a separate array uh, on which they have some sort of cross attention uh, in every layer. But the, the sort of the core flow of information in the transformer is in a latent space, which is uh, much smaller than the input. Um, and uh, this way they can basically process very large input uh, arrays, like images or audio or video, all with the same architecture. And that's the amazing thing about the perceiver. And they get pretty good uh, results with that. And they later, um, with the perceiver IO, generalize that from classification tasks also to full like sequence to sequence learning. And now with this hierarchical perceiver is a, an, another paper from this uh, group at DeepMind uh, under Andrew Yegle. Uh, and what they do here is they, uh, uh, the problem with this is that you need some sort of positional encodings, right? So if you have like an image, you need to know which uh, part of the image every pixel is coming from. Or if you have a, uh, a document, you need to have a sequence of words and you need, like in BERT, you have these uh, kind of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, some kind of cosine function as the uh, positional encoding. So it's very simple uh, positional embedding. So in this perceiver architecture, they actually did uh, Fourier uh, 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 positional embeddings. Which is a way to uh, some encode this in some, to some sort of uh, frequency function, and then they take the Fourier transform uh, on that. Uh, but that's pretty complex, and it doesn't work the same way, exactly the same way for text or audio or images. Uh, so now in this hierarchical perceiver, they kind of try to uh, get across that, and what they do is they train. Uh, so they take this array. You, know, you see this here in this figure two. And they split the um, adjacent uh, patches of the uh, input uh, up into groups and then try to um, do some sort of masked autoencoder on them uh, to, to learn to compress them, basically. And these compressed representations, they use then as um, the positional embeddings. That's the way I understand it, but it's pretty complex uh, paper and um, um, I haven't spent like days and days studying it yet, but I think that's the idea. And that allows you to process even larger inputs uh, without the problems uh, with Fourier or other learned uh, encodings. And they claim that it's kind of the first paper which makes learned uh, position em uh, embeddings work. Yeah, so. uh, yeah. No, it's certainly uh, interesting, and I do feel like there's these uh, there's been this whole sort of convergence into unifications of architectures um, in machine learning, right? Into these transformer-like attention-based uh, yeah. models for across um, different modalities of text, uh, sound, um, video, uh, computer vision. 
So yeah. I think it's kind of a interesting Well, step. yeah, we've, uh, in our last webinar, we discussed like how, you know, the battle between Convenets and Transformers and how vision transformers are not really transformers, but they have some convolution in them. I think this also um, um, uh, has an impact on the discussion because here they also learn fully these kind of domain specific uh, pre-processing functions. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a, an important asterisk you have to add to these um, perceiver models, right? There's always this pre-processing, converting uh, an image into an array of pixels is a, um, a decision that needs to be made for each modality, so to speak. Yeah, so I want to see the combination of this hierarchical perceiver with the thousand layer uh, transformer. I think that's doable. We'll see uh, where that leads. Maybe they, they could be working on that already. Uh, we'll see in the next few months. Um, the next one is a quick overview of the compute trends of, of, um, of ML, right? Seen from the lens of of the training compute required. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting to sort of understand how, what has happened in this uh, space throughout the history. What, what would you take from this um, survey, Jacob? Um, yeah, I was, I mean, they don't have any super, uh, you know, it, it doesn't present information that you really didn't know, right? Like before GPUs, uh, compute in in machine learning was roughly following Moore's law because well what could you do right yeah exactly. <laughs> they were constrained by that and then uh, uh, with the advent of GPUs uh, compute started to double a lot more uh, like like a lot more uh, a lot more frequently uh, every six months uh, and what they see is that actually recently this has kind of slowed down with the large, uh, super large models. Yeah, with the super large uh, uh, language models, um, kind of starting a few years ago, this has actually slowed down a little bit. You see that in this picture, uh, that the the sort of the trend line for these very large models uh, is is going um, a lot slower, and I think that's because. Uh, the uh, the new bottleneck is distributed training, right? You need to train a model across many compute nodes. You cannot do it on a single one. And yeah, that brings you, we've discussed things like deep speed and uh, and all that. And uh, yeah, that brings a lot of inefficiency. So um, so I think that's yeah. our current bottleneck. Yeah, no, I, I, I do think that also as, uh, well, I mean, when I read this, um, it came to my mind how, um, this, this sort of goes very much in line with uh, the growing importance of um, AI, accel like AI, AI accelerated uh, hardware specialized for, for AI in the sense that, you know, since hardware, uh, sorry, since application, like the demand of computation has been growing faster than, than sort of the vanilla Moore's law or, or, or the, you know, how fast regular compute is accelerating. Uh, there's this sort of pressing demand for uh, for faster uh, specialized hardware, and that's how you know the, the compute, in a sense, is um, hopefully going to keep up in the in the upcoming years with more. Well, maybe things. maybe if we can do gradients without backprop, then uh, <laughs> then we we can do with simpler hardware. <laughs> Who knows? Yes. And uh, another, uh, of course, tr uh, recent trend uh, of reducing the hardware cost uh, or like making very large models more efficient to train and to, to do inference is um, a mixture of experts, right? So we've seen um, uh, models with over a trillion parameters uh, being trained um, uh, using this architecture. Uh, and in mixtures of expert, basically uh, specific inputs are routed to different subnetworks uh, and the other ones are kind of inactive. So, uh, so you can do uh, things in a more distributed way. It's more efficient for, for uh, distributing training over uh, many compute nodes. Um, and we wanted to point your attention to this paper, which gives a kind of overview. It's uh, not really by um, the least of the field. So uh, uh, Barrett Sob is first author uh, with contributions by Jeff Dean and uh, Noam uh, Shazir. So this is really kind of uh, the guys who really know how to do this at Google. 
uh, they they recipe. explain their tricks. So um, yeah, like a recipe for um, for building these things. Yeah, and uh, um, what was their their sort of main contribution? Was it is it this Z yeah. loss? Yeah, they, they propose these Z loss that they claim that uh, stabilizes training without degrading quality because previously there's there's this often this trade off of all the regularization factors that you add to the training to make the training stable end up hurting performance. And you have this sort of trade-off that you have to balance. Um, and they propose this uh, Z loss that um, uh, they say that is sort of, uh, you know, optimal and, and sort of solves that problem. Yeah. But, and they have all these kind of rule of the thumbs on how to uh, choose the capacity factor. So how, how 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 many experts or token will go to, and um, and the total number of experts and all that. So if you're into MOE training, uh, you should read this yeah. one. So I think we're getting to towards the um, end of our webinar, but we still have a couple of more papers to look into. Oh, this one so, is really cool. Oh, quickly, yeah. Uh, this one is really uh, uh, eye candy. Um, so there's this block uh, neural radiance field. Basically, these uh, neural radiance fields uh, were, is a technique that was proposed in 2020, I believe, at ECCV, um, which uses neural networks to render novel viewpoints of a, of a scene, given only a few um, examples. And this has been pretty popular um, as a sort of neural rendering um, to get photorealistic models of objects. The, one of the big problems, though, is that you need one single model to represent one scene. So you represent one object and you have one parameter that you train with that object and that constrains the application uh, to pretty small scenes, like you know, like having a model of um, rendering new views of a, of, a, of a small object or something like that. So what they do here is they apply this system and they do this block uh, and our uh, neural gradient fields. Um, to sort of merge different models that are trained independently of a large scene. And they build this model of um, a few blocks in uh, San Francisco. And they collect this uh, data set of 2.3, I think, million images along with their you know, um, position. Um, guys are from, uh, the guys are from Waymo. So they have a lot of cars with, with yeah. cameras driving around there. Um, and I think it's really cool. And the, the, the cool thing is that this can be scaled to arbitrarily large uh, scenes, right? So, I mean, you can see in the demos that they have in the website that it's, it's not photorealistic quite yet, but it's certainly an interesting direction to see, um, you know, that will probably be relevant in, in building, you know, um, virtual reality environments that are photorealistic and, and photorealistic and all of these kind of, um, of things. I was showing this to uh, people from the city of Amsterdam, and they were like, hmm, this is very interesting. We need to <laughs> get on top of this. So definitely a lot of cities in the world want to have a digital replica, if only uh, for the very sad reason that uh, they might not look the same in, uh, in a month or so, which is... Uh, yeah in some places in the world, unfortunately. Um, all right. I think we have, I think this is the last one, yeah. So um, very quickly, uh, generating audio with uh, state space models. So we've talked about audio a bit before here. And uh, one of the reasons why um, audio that is interesting is that uh, it's very challenging to model by machine learning because it has a very um, dense sampling rate. So one second of audio normally is represented in a 40,000, around 40,000 hertz sampling. So that means that one second of audio is 40,000 <coughs> uh, which means that looking at, you know, looking back a couple of seconds um, in audio space um, is sort of very long range dependency. Uh, so th this means that historically, a lot of intermediate representations have been used to do machine learning on audio, but since WaveNet came around, I think in 2016, um, there's been growing interest in, in uh, you know, pro modeling raw audio, uh, which has this challenge of very long range dependencies and you need to be able to model that um, really well. So what they propose here is to use this state space representation, which is something that is used in control theory um, a lot. Um, and they basically um, build this uh, model that uses this representation um, and what I think that the most interesting uh, bit to look into this slide is this context 
um, size that they show here that it's uh, 128,000 samples. That is um, a pretty large context um, and in, in audio that's important. And pretty much they show that they have state of the art um, generation of, of audio as judged by, by humans. And, uh, and um, yeah, it's definitely an, kind of um, an approach that might be useful uh, for these kind of very long range dependencies, maybe even in connection with the, the perceiver stuff that we have talked about. Um, so yeah, these are definitely sort of the the uh, order of magnitude of inputs that a perceiver uh, is designed to handle. So uh, I would imagine that 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 could get uh, applied to the same task very easily. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think we have a, a couple of light uh, notes to end our discussion from here, right? Um, which is this uh, kind of controversial tweet that Ilya Sutskaver, um, and he's a head of research at OpenAI, uh, tweeted at the beginning of the month, saying that maybe large neural networks are slightly conscious in some meaningful way. Um, and this kind of unraveled this whole uh, <laughs> tweet, tweet storm from- I uh, like this reply by Jan <laughs> LeCun, which is very <laughs> bluntly said, no. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, essentially, exactly. like all, all of Twitter fell on top of Ilya Sutskever, accusing yeah. uh, him of being uh, like, a, uh, how do you say, like a very naive, uninformed of the last 300 years of philosophical debate around consciousness, uh, like an ar armchair hobby philosopher. Um, <laughs> and I think most people are right, actually. And uh, uh, it's a bit of a high building that we uh, are known to see from OpenAI. Uh, yeah. But then I saw this tweet <laughs> and uh, it made me think differently about the first tweet because Why? if he's talking about the alignment, pro the alignment problem is something else, right? It's, about, it's like mm -hmm. aligning the model's behavior with human values. Yeah. Um, Imagine being the adoptive parents of baby Superman. And I thought, why is he talking about consciousness? Uh, well, maybe because he's working on GPT-4 and he has already seen what it does and we haven't. <laughs> and so Jan LeCun does not, has not seen GPT-4 yet, but Ilya, Ilya has. And maybe that's why they're, I have slightly different opinions. Well, I don't think so, but... Uh, uh, it could be, and uh, definitely OpenAI is working on their next big model. And I mean, it's really, uh, um, yeah, it's really exciting to uh, imagine what, what it will look like. It will probably be multimodal, I think. That's my guess. Could be. I, I really, uh, we'll see. I really hope that the, some, somewhere in the first half of this year, um, they release some, some kind of model. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I, in all fairness, I, I, I really think that GPT-3 really is really um, sort of shaped a lot of, uh, you know, people's perceptions of, of these models and kind of um, challenged what, uh, you know, the, the perception of what they could do um, for the better. Um, so, yeah, well, for sure, uh, we've, we've shown that it's a very good model to generate training data for, uh, for your exactly. research models. So exactly. The, who knows what uh, what all the applications are? Well, let's hope they are peaceful and um, that uh, we see each other again in a month. Here, thank you for uh, attending, and uh, uh, we hope the world is going to come to its senses and um, and head towards peace instead of war. Yeah, like uh, I think someone said in the in the chat, uh, you can. Um check out uh, the, the written version of this on our uh, on our blog. Uh, I'll make sure that we have a recording of this on our YouTube channel um, as well so that you can do it later. Um, and yeah, and I will see you again uh, next month. And thank you for, for listening to us and joining us.